The number one myth that, that Westerners have about this conflict is that Arabs and Jews have been fighting for thousands of years and they're going to continue to fight. This is really quite bizarre because all it takes is a little bit of reading of history to find out that this just isn't true. There is no congenital historical enmity between the Arabs and the Jews. The Jews flourished in the Arab world at a time when they were being persecuted throughout all of Europe. At the end of the 19th century, because of anti-Semitism in Europe, European Jews began to try and figure out a solution to the Jewish problem. A very small minority adhered to Zionism, the idea that the only place in which they could be safe is within the Jewish state. Zionist Jews um, actually had a, a design on uh, the land of Palestine, the idea of creating a homeland for Jews in the land of Palestine. And this uh, is really the beginning of the conflict. The mainstream Israeli Jewish society believed, because that's the way they had been educated, that Palestine was empty, had been empty when the Jewish settlers came there. Who paid the price when they settled there? Is it really true that Israel was a land without a people for a people without a land? Palestine was not empty. It was a land populated by Arabs who had a high level of culture, high level of education. With farms and markets and towns and villages and roads and commerce and lots of interaction with the rest of the world. The population was overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly Arab. Jewish immigration increased under British rule following World War I, when Britain implemented the Balfour Declaration, promising a Jewish homeland in Palestine. This measure conflicted with Britain's previous promise of self-rule for Arab inhabitants throughout the region. Britain was basically extremely supportive of the Zionist movement. It helped to establish all of the structures of a state. At the same time, the Arabs of Palestine were denied the right of self-determination. The Palestinians saw a European power decide the future of a non-European territory in flat disregard of both their presence and wishes. In the 1920s, as land was being stripped away from local residents, the first clashes between Palestinians and Jews began and would continue on for years to come. Until the early 1930s, the Jewish population of Palestine remained under 17%. Hitler's rise to power in Germany completely changed that. In just five years, 174,000 Jews flooded into Palestine, doubling their population. As the world attempted to make amends for the horrors of Nazi genocidal policies, efforts to make Palestine a Jewish homeland increased. In 1947, with the conflict spiraling out of control, Britain decided to turn the problem of Palestine over to the United Nations. The UN, under pressure, proposed to divide the land into two states, an Arab state and a Jewish state. Arabs were to be given 43% of the land, despite the fact that they made up more than two-thirds of the population and owned over 92% of the land. Jews were to be given 56%, although they comprised only one-third of the population and owned less than 8% of the total area. Nevertheless, they were given not only most of the land, they were given the most fertile land. Zionist leaders took advantage of their superior military preparation and immediately began occupying major Arab cities in Palestine. We found out that there was a systematic expulsion of Palestinians, and there was, as I said, there was an ethnic cleansing operation taking place. The most infamous campaign 
was the massacre at the village of Der Yassin, where over 100 men, women, and children were systematically murdered. The ruthlessness of the attack on Der Yassin drove fear and panic into the Palestinian population and led to the flight of unarmed civilians from their homes all over the country. As a result, maybe 300 or so thousand Palestinians had already been expelled before the first Arab soldier entered Palestine. Some of the neighboring Arab armies finally intervened after May 15, 1948, when Israel officially announced its statehood. Although there was a lot of war rhetoric on the Arab side, very few soldiers, Arab soldiers, were sent into the battlefield. And actually, for most parts of the war, there was a superiority uh, on the side of the Israeli uh, army. The Israeli army cleansed much of the territory and took over a large part of the designated Palestinian state. The new state of Israel encompassed 78% of the total land of Palestine. The West Bank came under Jordanian control and the Gaza Strip under Egyptian dominion. Although a truce was declared between Israel and the Arab states, true peace remained elusive as over 700,000 Palestinian refugees languished in nearby camps, often in sight of homes to which they still held the deeds and a deep desire to return. Most of the deserted and evicted Palestinian uh, villages were erased from upon the earth and were either turned into Jewish settlements or into uh, fertile uh, land. Of the 500 Palestinian villages in what became in Israel in 1948, 400 were destroyed. These efforts to destroy the possibility of their returning home were countered by the United Nations, which continues to affirm their human right enshrined in international law and morality to return. And so they began from 1947, from November 1947, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. Now, a lot of people talk about Oh, you know, the, this war of 1948, uh, the war of 1948 that supposedly started in May 1947 after Israel declared its state. Uh, May 1947, Israel declared the state of Israel, and then they said all of the Arab countries attacked us. But what they neglect to tell you is that the ethnic cleansing of Palestine began in November 1947, six months before any state of Israel was declared. As soon as that resolution was passed and it was rejected, and you understand now why it was rejected, they immediately went into action. First of all, the Israelis secured the 55% that was to be in their state, and they got rid of almost 90% of any Palestinians who were living in that first 55% that they wanted for their state. They ethnically cleansed. There were about 11 major towns or cities completely emptied of their Palestinian inhabitants. Can you imagine, uh, like the Gold Coast, for example, completely emptied of, of its indigenous people? This is what they did. 11 major towns and cities completely emptied of their inhabitants, either killed or driven out. And the, at least 35 massacres were, took place. And this is not from Palestinian historians. Israeli historians documented 35 massacres that took place during this period. So you had hundreds of thousands of Palestinians driven from their homes and land just in this first six months alone. They estimate about a quarter of a million, 250,000, driven from their homes and land just in this first six months alone. And then the process continued. So this, this ethnic cleansing continued for six months. In the end, about 800,000 Palestinians were driven from their homes and land. And so many more were murdered, so many women were raped. This is well documented by the historians. But 800,000 driven from their homes and land. When we talk about the Palestinian refugees, right, the right of return of Palestinian refugees, we're talking about the descendants of these 800,000 people that were driven from their homes and land. I'll come back to this issue of right of return, but one thing we should remember is, can you tell me 
one other international conflict where refugees haven't been able to return to their home and land. Always it's the case. It's just the international standard. When you have war and then you have some resolution, the people get to return to their homes and land, except in this case, except in the case of Palestine. 800,000 driven from their homes and land and never to be returned. Now they number between four and seven million people. We'll come back to that issue later. In May 1948, Israel declares the state of Israel. Okay, they declare their independence, they declare the state of Israel. Over 78% of historical Palestine. Now, if anyone who's been paying attention to what I've been saying knows that the UN only ever allocated 55%. How is it that they're declaring a state on 78% of historical Palestine? Basically, all of that territory between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, except the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. How do they declare a state over all of this area? How do they even come to possess anything more than that 55%? They did it through ethnic cleansing, and that's something the international community needs to answer for. Anyone who talks about, oh, the right of Israel to exist and, uh, you know, recognition of Israel, in that is recognition of ethnic cleansing. So which Western government is prepared to do that? Because that's the reality. That is the only way they came to possess that extra 23%, not through the UN, through ethnic cleansing. So let's all keep that in mind. It's only after Israel declares its state that any Arab army enters Palestine. No Arab army entered before then. After this declaration, then you see the armies from Egypt, Syria, Jordan, also some from Lebanon, even some from Iraq come. But Israel is, is very well equipped, very powerful. In fact, numerically they had more troops than any of these Arab countries combined. Well, more troops than what the Arab countries were committing. Better weapons than what the Arab countries were committing. The only significant challenge was that mounted by the, the Arab Legion, which is basically controlled by Jordan. This is the only army that mounted any significant challenge. And what they were able to do was maintain uh, control of the West Bank. So after this so-called War of 1948, which ended about a year later, 1949, 1950, we see Israel in possession of 78% of historical Palestine. The Gaza Strip, the area known as the Gaza Strip, was under the control of Egypt, and the West Bank, including Jerusalem, in including upwards, was under the control of Jordan. Uh, and this ha is how the situ situation remained for the next, say, 20 years. Until 1967, Israel again goes to war with Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. In this war, it captures the, the, the Gaza Strip and, in fact, the Sinai Peninsula as well from Egypt. It captures the West Bank, including uh, Jerusalem from the, from the Jordanians, and it captures the Golan Heights from Syria. So it, it comes into possession of all of this territory. So today when they refer to the occupied territories or the occupied Palestinian territories, they're referring to the Gaza Strip and the West Bank that were captured in 1967. And from this point on, the Palestinians who live in the Gaza Strip and the West Bank are faced with a military, Israeli military occupation. And that situation has continued all the way up until today. But one more thing that we should understand about this conflict is that there are a number of layers that have been built on. Now, I mentioned about the, the original problem, the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people. 800,000 driven from their homes and land, so many massacres and so on. Uh, the property that the Israelis came to possess. Because when they drove the Palestinians from their land, from their homes, they, they captured all of their... Uh, fruit groves, their olive trees, their citrus trees. They took their houses and they went and lived in their houses and they brought more Jews from Europe and different parts of the world and put them in those houses, Palestinian houses. They just took over complete villages. That's the ones that they didn't raise to the ground. And anyone who's... I should have given some background about myself. I, my PhD thesis is on the Israel-Palestine conflict and I went there in 2006 and that's where I did my field research. And there are some places in Israel where they built these, you know, beautiful, you know, forests, you know, because they're so environmentally friendly, so they build these wonderful forests. Those forests that they've built are built over Palestinian villages that have been razed to the ground and all the people in those villages were massacred. That's where they built those parks and forests. 
Okay? So if you ever go there, look very closely at the ground and in some places you'll actually see the foundations of people's homes and they built forests over that to try and disguise the ethnic cleansing that took place. You can see it for yourself. Who paid the price when they settled there? Is it really true that Israel was a land without a people for a people without a land? Palestine was not empty. It was a land populated by Arabs who had a high level of culture, a high level of education. With farms and markets and towns and villages and roads. A design on uh, the land of Palestine, the idea of creating a homeland for Jews in the land of Palestine. And this uh, is really the beginning of the conflict. The mainstream Israeli Jewish society believed, because that's the way they had been educated, that Palestine was empty, had been empty, when the Jewish settlers came there. At the end of the 19th century, because of anti-Semitism in Europe, European Jews began to try and figure out a solution to the Jewish problem. A very small minority adhered to Zionism, the idea that the only place in which they could be safe is within the Jewish state. Zionist Jews um, actually had a The number one myth that, that Westerners have about this conflict is that Arabs and Jews have been fighting for thousands of years and they're going to continue to fight. This is really quite bizarre because all it takes is a little bit of reading of history to find out that this just isn't true. There is no congenital historical enmity between the Arabs and the Jews. The Jews flourished in the Arab world at a time when they were being persecuted throughout all of Europe. 